restaurants. There's nothing more satisfactory, satisfying than a cold glass of water. Making waves, some big, some small, some little drips, some big white water. It's talking, that water. That's the way it talks. That's the way it moves. Because it's living. Yeah. Totally. Well, if it's dripping over the top, it's probably full, right? So connecting people who are going in one, to one particular destination or direction with people who are already traveling there. And there's all, I mean, there's a, there's, it's just exploding on the internet now, this kind of social transit. So that's people sharing their own cars, sharing a ride. Um, and, and this is where there's so much opportunity uh, for um, filling in the cracks between the big transit projects which take a long time and, and are really good at moving large amounts of people from one place to another but not always great at, at changing at being flexible enough to change as our patterns of travel change uh, and also not necessarily being great at kind of connecting people from those big places and so that's also where the idea of a, uh, of a hub comes in. Tr big transit is great at moving people from point A to point B but once people get there, they need a hub of opportunity, of flexibility at that point B. So they need to be able to get out and rent a bike or rent a car or share a taxi or shuttle bus. Obviously they need buses on, on regular routes, but, but they may need to, to get to a place that's kind of inconvenient or takes a long time. So we need to come offer them the opportunities. Uh, and if it's a business, well, they'll pay to get to, for someone to rent a car to get somewhere quickly. But why not let people that are going travel all the way up to Finch and then get a car to finish the journey uh, rather than having starting off downtown in a car and and so that's you know really looking at this idea of, of mobility hubs which are happening all over the world and quite frankly are happening already you know half of the Toronto Transit this is a uh, village that has subway limits. stops have auto share vehicles within a five minute walk the flood plane, so the um, auto share is already uh, working with the TTC, environment the TTC just doesn't know it, the other to build transit hubs. And so now, the railways, the with roads, a look at, at bike sharing and some of these other things, let's this, the get paths, someone the together uh, and, 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 and do so this. Uh, how this. I saw a job posting into uh, yesterday on Metrolink, uh, and, and the, the word innovation the project, is in the job title. And I think that's the kind of thing that we need is people innovating, looking at these things that are happening and saying, okay, how can we just kind of group these things together a little bit, get isolation. these people talking, and, and it's not necessarily expensive, it's just somebody saying, hey, let's done. take a look at what's Things going on and way, let's make it work more efficiently. More to be done. We're going through, going through a, a, a similar, similar energy, energy transformation, transformation now about moving to, to low carbon, low carbon future. future, and, and it, it is going to have, have mass implications for, for uh, our economies, our lifestyles, our health, the environment, the world. And, and, and thankfully, thankfully, because, because uh, time is of the essence, the essence uh, certainly uh, from a climate, climate change, change perspective. perspective. So, so we, the we vision we have here at Bullfrog, Bullfrog, Bullfrog is a vision of a 100% renewable energy future. future. That's, That's not, not as, as far as away as a lot of people, people think, think. Let me just close by um, giving you the example of Denmark and Sweden that have greenhouse gas footprints that are one-seventh or less than ours on a per capita basis. And uh, you'll see communities in those two countries that have developed renewables in a very significant way. Uh, the, uh, the Danes, for instance, would never allow the Queen Elizabeth power plant to um, uh, release its, um, all its waste heat into the river. They'd be capturing that heat and they'd be using it to heat the entire downtown of Saskatoon. 
and that's what they do as a matter of standard practice in in um, cities like Stockholm and Copenhagen. Uh, district heating is just thought to be routine. Um, and with district heating, uh, where you can use waste heat sources, but you can also use hot water sources as a way of heating your buildings. With district heating, bear in mind, comes an enormous potential to use renewable energy. So if we are looking for ways of um, uh, you know, substituting, for instance, natural gas for renewables, uh, district heating with hot water is an excellent way to do that. And we could be building all our new subdivisions uh, using district heating. How many individuals really take up, take up the issue? I do believe that over the next five to ten years, people are going to become much more literate about energy than they are currently. If you, if you rewind the clock, you don't even have to rewind the clock. You could, you could ask most people, where does your electricity come from? Like, how is it generated? What are the environmental impacts of generating that? Most people, and we've done a number of these surveys, most people don't know where their electricity comes from and, and that it has an environmental impact. Um, so, but I, I think the level of energy literacy will increase dramatically over the next five to ten years. I'm John Hillier. Hi. <laughs> um, and a landscape architect with uh, DTAH. There are finite resources and we have to, we have to live within them. And I, I think of green design as, as, as facing up to that. Could you imagine doing this for like 12 hours a day looking for tiny pieces of gold?